So, uh, it's now time to start uh, with our panel of speakers. Um, and welcome to those joining us online as well. So this panel of speakers is going to cover the topic of surface transport. So as Jim said, that's everything on the ground. So trains, buses, walking, cycling, and so on. Everything that's not flying, essentially. Uh, we have six speakers in total, but we're going to hear from three at a time to break things up a little bit. The first three speakers are going to be Gillian Annabel. I apologize for pronouncing your name wrong earlier, from the University of Leeds, uh, who's going to provide an introduction to surface transport. We're then going to have Ellie Davis from the Committee on Climate Change talking about reducing emissions from cars. And then Lynn Sloman from, the, from Transport for Quality of Life, who's going to talk about alternatives to cars. So as usual, we're going to stop after each speaker for a chance to, for you to write down questions. You're welcome to note them down as we go along as well, if you like. Um, you have your yellow and red cards um, at tables. Uh, please do card the speakers uh, if they're uh, not being clear. So a yellow card uh, if they're going too quickly, a red card um, if they've been unclear and you'd like them to explain themselves a little better. We are going to record what all these speakers are saying and they will be on the website afterwards, but as usual we also have copies of their slides at tables. Um, there's enough for one between two, so do ask your table facilitator now if you'd like a copy. And so there's just one new thing to mention. Um, Jim did talk about it before, um, but we have two types of speaker for you. So we have what we call informants, who are here to tell you about the range of research and views that exist in the area they're speaking about, but who are not going to give you their personal opinion. So it's about explaining the range of views and research that exists. And then we have speakers who are what are we call, or who are what we call advocates, who are here to give you their personal view or the view of their organisation. And we'll remind you which is which um, as we go along. The first three speakers are all informants, so they're not going to give you a personal view. And with that, I will hand over to Gillian. Thank you very much, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Really, really nice to be here. Um, and uh, everything I say, as Sarah has explained, I'm, I'm an informant. Everything I say is going to be absent of personal opinion, apart from to say that congratulations being in this panel, because uh, I think transport is a fabulous topic. But I would say that because I live and, and breathe it on a, on a daily basis. So I'm going to give you an introduction to surface travel. And it might seem quite obvious. It kind of is. Surface travel is everything that doesn't involve getting airborne or uh, travelling across or through water, unless something uh, has gone terribly wrong with your surface travel, of course. Um, but within that, uh, there's actually a variety of different modes. So just to make sure we've you know, got, our, got our minds thinking about all the different possibilities, within surface transport, you have cars. Cars can be driven as a passenger. They can be, uh, sorry, driven or, or travelled in as a passenger, of course. You have pub a variety of different public transport modes. The main ones that we think about are buses and trains, but you also have light rail, trams in local areas, underground systems. You can even have different types of uh, bus provision, trolley buses, which are also powered by overhead electric wires. So there's a whole variety there. And actually, even within that, we are increasingly seeing different ways in which buses are operated. So we think about buses often on conventional fixed routes and timetables, but there are many different places and more and more where those buses are provided on a, what's called an on-demand system. So you can dial them up and they're much more flexible in their timings. So again, there's a sort of a, a spectrum there of different ways of providing public transport. And then we have what we, in the business, if you like, tend to lump together as active modes of travel. And these are modes of travel that are done under our own esteem, largely, walking, cycling, increasingly things like scootering, hoverboards, and they can be powered also uh, increasingly by electric power, so electric bikes, e-bikes, e-scooters. And then often in the statistics, the way we gather the data around how people travel, we have an other category. And in that other category, mainly are taxis. So taxis, mostly cars. Um, but we count them slightly differently because it's a way of, of people getting from A to B with a, a certain type of providing um, that means of transport. 
But the other distinction I really, that's really important to make within surface travel is between surface and freight transport. And uh, although there can be some overlap, we, we, we speak about those surface modes that I've just gone through, but in freight, of course, we're talking about another set of vehicles, so vans and lorries. Some people might use vans as, as a personal form of transport, so there's a slight grey area there, but largely we think of freight and we think of vans um, and lorries. Some freight also goes on the rail, so again, another bit of a grey area. But the reason why I really mention it with emphasis now is because in our deliberations in this panel, uh, and also the expert advice and so on that you're getting, we're going to be focusing on passenger travel, on personal travel, on the way in which we largely get around. And that's not because the freight side of things is not important, which it is, and it's not to say that we can, we can think about it as or we don't have to do anything about that bit. We can sort of assume that there will be efforts to decarbonise that, but because our experience, our daily experience, uh, is around personal travel. We want to focus these discussions around that. And then one final thing, just to say, because it will crop up here and there, is there's a, another way of accessing things which increasingly we think about under transport, which is virtual travel. So what we mean by that is that there are some things that we access or that we do that we can increasingly do online. So we can do online banking instead of going to the bank. Um, and we can do video conferencing at work or even um, you can do video like Skyping or FaceTime for personal reasons. So some of, sometimes those kind of virtual means actually substitute for travel uh, and mean that, th that there's no physical travel involved. So that's the kind of nuts and bolts just to sort of lay the landscape out for you. Uh, now, um, just to remind us, so if we take all transport, that is surface plus air and sea, it's a third of greenhouse gas emissions. If we just take all surface transport, so that's including the freight, freight plus passenger, that's around a quarter or just under a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. But just thinking about what we're dealing with this afternoon, this afternoon bit, this bit which is personal surface travel, it's around 15% of greenhouse gas emissions. Now within that, um, on this slide I have both passenger and freight, just so you can see the relative difference. I know you've had lots and lots of pie charts, okay, um, but on this, um, we, the important thing to say is that cars make up the vast majority of surface transport, even when you include freight, and public transport at the moment is only around 5% of emissions. Now, when we think about the relative contributions of, of different modes of transport to greenhouse gas emissions, we have to think about not just how often a mode of transport is used, but also how much distance it travels overall. So I have here um, is this, this column here, or well, here are the modes of transport. This column here is the proportion of trips that each mode of transport is responsible for. Um, on average, for the average person, um, and this is the percentage of distance um, that it accounts for. So just pointing out some examples, the car is responsible for 61% of the journeys that we make, so 61% of the times that we go out it tends to be in the car, um, but it's responsible for 77% of distance, and that's because even though it does lots and lots of short journeys in the car, it also does a, a few very long journeys which actually account for lots and lots of distance. In fact, only 3% of the journeys that are undertaken in a car actually account um, for 30% of the distance travelled. Then we have things like walking. So walking is a hugely popular mode, 27% of trips, but actually only accounts for 3% of distance. So relatively speaking, it's not as important at the moment in terms of consuming the, the distance that we travel. And then we can go down those, those various different modes. And it's really important when we think about this, not just how many trips that each um, mode of transport can replace or undertake, but how much distance they can actually account for. Just a couple of points on cars. 
One of the, the main things I want to say is actually the figure, right, the, the line right at the bottom of this slide, which is just to remember that 24% of households don't have a car at all, and that's either because they can't afford it or they've chosen not to own one. So we can't, although the car is incredibly important in society, it's not everyone that has a car. The other thing to say is, although I'm not here to say the car isn't good, it's a very efficient in many ways, or efficient for our lifestyle in many ways, there's also a lot of inefficiencies built in with the car. So there's many, many journeys whereby it's only one person in that car. Uh, the car is parked for 98% of its time somewhere or other, uh, mostly at home. A third of all cars don't go out on any given day at all. So we do have to think about whether or not that is a resource that we as a society, which many of us pay a lot of money to, to, to have, um, can maybe be used a little bit more efficiently for the good of uh, us as individuals, but also as the good of as society. And the other thing is that, understandably, in the media, there's a lot of attention paid to commute, commuting, getting to work, um, but also a lot of attention often paid to the journey to school. You hear a lot, kind of anecdotally, you know, if only we could have not so many children taken uh, to school by car, we might solve a lot of problems. It is important to note that commuting only takes up 20% of all the distance that's traveled, and school journeys only around 2%. And it's actually all the other things we do in cars, personal business, that's things like caring, or going to the health appointments, and all the leisure activities in all their different forms, that where we really are um, taking up a lot of, of time and distance and energy in our transport system. And then we, as this is the real meat of things, and you have this uh, to refer to, I think it might be useful for, to refer to it several times. There is a way of trying to think about, okay, what are the solutions? And this is just one, one sort of way cl we've classified various things. In the waste um, industry, you've probably heard of the hierarchy, um, which is to... to um, uh, reduce the amount of waste, the amount of, of product, to, when we can't do that, to recycle uh, uh, the rest of it and, and to remove the rest of it. Well, this is a similar kind of thing. Avoiding, shifting and improving. So avoiding is organising um, the services that we, we have to get to, the things that we want to access, organising them in such a way that perhaps we don't have to travel so far to get to them. Um, shifting is about making sure that each time a journey is undertaken, uh, it's done on the most efficient mode, the cleanest mode, if you like, that it possibly can be. So that's about having lots of choice uh, for the different journeys, not just uh, the, the car being the only thing that people can use, which is often the case. And the final thing is about improving. And this essentially is most of the technical options. So making the, the emissions performance performance of vehicles better, um, so that might be things like efficiency improvements, better engines, um, but it might be making them very clean in terms of having electric uh, powertrains or hydrogen, um, and it could also be the, making the performance better by things like lowering speed limits because you, um, just any form of transport uses less fuel, less energy at certain optimum speeds. Um, so within, within these different categories, there are a lot of different types of things you can do and avoid, you can plan. Um, we'll hear about land use planning in one of the talks coming um, up about planning our, where our housing is and our services are, um, about uh, shifting, which is all about our public transport options and our walking and cycling options, investing in them, subsidising in them, maybe closing road capacity, maybe charging for roads, so a whole suite of different things. Um, and improving is, is mainly about the technical options and the fuels. Um, and I've, I've, got, I've got to wrap up, but on this slide there's more examples of, of, of what the different sort of elements and types of policies are. This is not by any means a, a clean slate. You will have your own ideas, as there are very many of those different ideas for informing people, for regulating, subsidising, for pricing, taxing. These are all different levers in, policy levers that we can use. And then the final thing just to say is that 
that we're all here to think about reaching the net zero target. But transport, I think, is one of the areas in particular, in fact, all areas are really, but in particular where you can really think about all kinds of other reasons, not just for climate change, where we might want to do all exactly the same things that we're going to be talking about making our streets better, uh, our towns and cities better places to live, cleaner air, uh, getting people out, exercising, less sedentary lifestyles, more safe environments and so on. Uh, so it's, it, and most of the things, almost without exclusion, that we're going to be talking about for mitigating, reducing climate emissions are also going to be uh, working towards some of these other wider objectives and benefits as well. So thank you. So, uh, as usual, we're going to pause uh, for you to write down questions you'd like to ask Gillian. Um, you can write down each up to two questions that you'd like to ask her, please. One question per post-it.